snakes. First thing that comes to most people's mind, the only good snake is a dead snake. We, by and large, are afraid of snakes. I never did have that fear. We have 34 species of snakes in Tennessee. We only have four venomous snakes. Pygmy rattlesnake, the cottonmouth, the copperhead, and the timber rattlesnake. Four venomous snakes. All the others are harmless. You're more likely to die from being struck by lightning than from a rattlesnake bite. They're not out to chase you. I came across one in my yard and it kind of sat there and just kind of watched me and I went about my business and didn't come after you. There shouldn't be that fear of that happening, right? That is correct. Their first line of defense is camouflage. They're just going to sit still. If they start feeling threatened, they'll start to rattle. They don't want to give their position away. Once they start rattling, what they want to do is escape. If you happen to be standing in the way of uh, where they want to get, they're going to come toward you to get under that rock. They're not chasing you. If you just back away, leave the snake alone, it will not harm you. The award-winning Tennessee Wildcast is on the air with the latest on hunting, fishing, boating, wildlife watching, and all things outdoors. Make welcome your host, drummer and outdoor expert novice, Jason Harmon. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Tennessee Wildcast. We're glad you're tuning in. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. we got a great show lined up for you today. We're back here at Cumberland University for another show, and I'm excited to have Dr. Danny Bryan with us today. We're going to be talking about snakes. I think we're going to get into some tick stuff. Uh, it's going to be a fun conversation, and, uh, and all the way from East Tennessee, Mr. Matt Cameron's helping us co-host, so I appreciate you being here, man. Man, glad to be in Lebanon, you know, and I figured I'd have to have a passport to go to Lebanon, but man, I, <laughs> I drove here, didn't have to take a plane or anything, so. Hey, I think uh, I think it's good to have you here, and we're going to, you know, keep talking outdoors and, and having a good time with it, but uh, you had this idea of, of pulling this show together, and I appreciate you doing that, so I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Likewise, we got some some good subject matter. I feel like this guy could talk for hours mm -hmm. if we had the time. But yeah, snakes, ticks, and getting bit by both of those creatures and, and wow. the experiences yeah. he had with it. That's what I really want to hear about, but we don't want to get into that too early because we'll save that towards the end. Well, I, I, I'd love to start about the campus here. Uh, Dr. Brown, you you taught here for a long time and, and uh, you know, we've just learn about this place and kind of a little bit of the history here before we dive in to much more. Well, you know, I might be part of the history here at Cumberland <laughs> University. I've been here for so long, but uh, uh, the university uh, was in place prior to the Civil War. It, it's actually a gym. It's one of the oldest universities here in Tennessee. It's a, it's a gym here in the middle of the state. Uh, we currently have uh, close to 3,000 students on campus. Mm. Um, a, a liberal arts school. We also uh, accept uh, Tennessee Promise students here so they can come here and get their first two years of education for, from the Tennessee Lottery there. Yeah, that's awesome. It's really an outstanding campus. It's, 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 you get a, a, a tremendous education in, in a small town. Uh, it's not like having to drive to the middle of uh, Nashville or have to go to Knoxville to get a good education. Yeah. Well, I, I drive through it uh, pretty often. And, and, uh, and we're also noted for the worst football defeat in history. The worst well, defeat. At the worst defeat. Um, you're familiar with uh, uh, Coach Heisman, uh -huh. Georgia Tech. Okay. The last year, Cumberland had a football team beat uh, Georgia Tech and knocked uh, – uh, Georgia Tech out of the national championship, right? <laughs> and then uh, uh, because we had contracts with Georgia Tech uh, that we had to fulfill, Cumberland uh, dropped their football team after after that year. But we still had the contract with Georgia Tech, and Georgia Tech threatened to sue and all this stuff. So just a group of students oh, wow. got together and went to Georgia Tech to play football. And uh, it didn't fare too well. Uh, <laughs> they got on a train, hopped down to Georgia Tech, and lost the football game 222 to nothing. Are you kidding <laughs> me? How is that even possible? Well, uh, it's like this. Well, the uh, quarterback had, or who was ever playing quarterback, had the ball, headed the ball off. The guy dropped it, and the quarterback looked at him and said, you dropped it, you pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> the other team there can pick it up, run it in for a touchdown. So, wow. ouch! See, when he said that, 
my first thought was Tennessee, South Carolina last year. I will never forgive <laughs> no. University of South Carolina for destroying us nine touchdowns in that game. Mm. That one hurt. So that's my first thought. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess 200 and what? 200? 222 to nothing. I guess that's a little worse. Wow. Wow. You, you don't think of a football game scoring that many points. <laughs> you touch the square every time you touch the ball? Yeah. Well, and oh, I didn't know we were going to get into sports today, but, uh, you know, Cumberland's got a great baseball team. Yes, they uh, do. They've had some great success in baseball. And uh, uh, remind me of the coach here. Uh, Woody Hunt. Woody he's, Hunt. He's retired. His son, Ryan, is coaching now. Correct. Mr. Hunt. Yeah. So that um, that's a great uh, – a great sport here as well. And and they have a wrestling team, men's wrestling team, okay. and they just won the uh, conference championship Friday night. Awesome. Uh, beat the number 10 uh, team in the country. I mean, just just demolished them. Cummins got it all, sounds like. Yeah, prospective <laughs> students, if you're listening, yeah. that might be the place for you. And, and you live not far from here, correct? Yeah, Jason? just down in, in Watertown here in Wilson County. Huh? Uh, it's a great place to live and uh, great, great uh, county to be in. Yeah, so... Well, uh, Matt, I know you pulled this together, and, we, and you you really wanted to to dive into this topic today, and I appreciate you doing that. Uh, where do you want to get started? I want to hear a little bit about his his educational background and his um, teaching background, if you don't mind us bring us up to uh, to this point in your career. Okay. Well, I had a, I earned an associate's degree from Motlow State, nineteen eighty. Graduated with from the University of Tennessee Knoxville in eighty three. Uh, 1987, I graduated from MTSU with my master's degree, uh, concentrating in botany. And then in uh, 2012, I wrapped up my PhD in, uh, at Tennessee Tech. And what was your, your doctorate thesis? So uh, uh, the uh, uh, natural history of uh, the timber rattlesnake at uh, Center Hill Lake was the topic of my uh, dissertation so put in gosh 12 plus years of research just on the center hill lake population of timber rattlesnakes there well you've been no stranger to uh to all the universities there you kind of covered them all and they're all wonderful yeah yeah we got a lot of great schools here in tennessee and we do uh along with you know being a professor here and, and studying all these other universities that's uh that's great a lot of our our wildlife education comes out of you know like you said university of tennessee and tennessee tech and even middle tennessee state university so that's cool um so i guess from from your education then moving into to your teaching uh cumberland university was one of them but you also taught at tennessee tech and, and martin methodist martin called, methodist so which is ut southern now so I spent three years at uh, uh, Martin Methodist College and then 33 years here at Cumberland University. 33. Mm -hmm. That's quite a career. Yeah. And, and the list of the things that this man has taught just blew my mind. I, I don't know if I'll go down all of them, but there's various types of biology, botany, zoology, microbiology, genetics, um, aquatic ecology, entomology, a lot of ologies, you know, stuff I can't even pronounce. <laughs> That impressed me. You know, a lot of times we talk to people who are experts in one subject matter. Um, you got your fish people and mm -hmm. you got people studied elk and they know a lot about this, but it looks like you've really um, studied and taught a lot of various subjects. Tell us about that. Well, it's if you take a look at my, my uh, graduate work, it was a lot of ecologies. Um, there was plant ecology, plant odd ecology, uplands ecology, aquatic ecology. Uh, I just go on and on animal ecology uh, and it, really if you are in the field of ecology you have to have a very diverse background and that includes botany mm -hmm. because it, what identifies a habitat it, you, you know you well you've got a, a temperate a deciduous forest right well what's in there what determines that well it's the species of plants so in, in order to be able to study animals you must know your plants so uh, my uh, undergraduate and, and my master's work was primarily in botany and well if you really want to know botany you need to know your pollinators right mm -hmm. your insects and, and um, how these Plants get spread and reproduce and time of year and all this stuff. And it all ties in together. 
You going to sing it, Jason? <laughs> the circle of life. <laughs> <of life. laughs> Indeed it does. And I appreciate that. And I was saying earlier when I went to college at UT in Knoxville, graduated in 03, but when I got down there, I didn't really care about anything other than a big game species, mm-hmm. largemouth bass, deer, turkey, whatever. But I found out that there are, you know, hundreds of different, hundreds of different bird species and hundreds of different fish species. And I, I grew to appreciate non-game wildlife and the importance they have to um, wildlife conservation as a whole. So, well, and you mentioned before the show that we that we manage what around 1,400 different species of wildlife, Correct. but only hunt close to a thousand of them. So it's a lot of close it is not hundred of them. Close to hunt, yeah, right, a hundred of them. And that's including all the migratory birds, like all the different ducks, yeah, and different fish. I yeah. mean, very few species do we actually hunt. So by and large, TWRA manages non-game wildlife species, and they are important. Which brings us up to snakes, mm-hmm. and and we could go with 10 different directions in this, but the first thing that comes to most people's mind when they hear of snake, the only good snake is a dead snake. We by and large are afraid of snakes in society. And I want you to help us appreciate them and respect them for their ecological value. And then tell us how we can be safe, you know, around them ultimately. Well, I really don't know where the fear of snakes actually comes from. When I, and I must've driven my parents just nuts. Because, you know, I didn't know, I would just go out and catch things, right? And mm. and bring them around and not knowing for sure what I had. And I knew that they probably were worried to death I was going to bring something venomous in at one time. But I never did have that fear. Um, and, and I think some of that is learned behavior. Mm. Uh, whether you were a child or something and you experienced something traumatic. But we have 34 species of snakes in Tennessee. Um, it, and, you know, you can give or take a couple, you know, for instance, like the coach whip snake. Uh, I think we've only had a, a couple that may have been collected in West Tennessee. So are they really native? But that's neither here nor there. Yeah. But of those um, uh, 34 snake species, we only have four venomous snakes. Uh, and that's the pygmy rattlesnake, the cottonmouth, the copperhead, and the timber rattlesnake. Now, once you get to Davidson County, get to uh, the central eastern part of Davidson County and go eastward, you don't have to worry about cotton mouse. Now, so that leaves you when you get to middle east Tennessee, mm-hmm. the east side of that, you've only got two venomous species to worry about, and that's a copperhead and a timber rattlesnake. We have pygmy rattlesnakes, but that tends to be uh, around land between the White Lakes there at Kentucky and, and going south along the Tennessee River drainage area there. So you don't have to worry them about them. But if you could identify four venomous snakes, all the others are harmless. Mm-hmm. All the others are harmless. And you, the most misidentified venomous snakes are copperheads and cottonmouths. Because there's so many other water snakes out there yes for example and and young snakes have a mimicry okay. uh, they'll have a pattern mimicry that may resemble a venomous snake and and some and all snakes will rattle their tail mm-hmm. when they get disturbed they'll rattle that tail and if they happen to be in dry leaves or something it will sound like a rattlesnake yeah. and people will confuse that for being a rattlesnake but uh, uh Timber rattlesnakes, people rarely get bit. As a matter of fact, the, the anti-venine, which is used to treat snake bites, doesn't even use timber rattlesnakes in the concoction to make the anti-venine. What is it made from? Uh, it Typically, it's the western diamondback, the eastern diamondback, the Mojave rattlesnake, and cottonmouths. Uh, people rarely get bit. By timber routes. So you're saying the anti-venine from any like pit viper will work for yes. another pit viper? Yes. It doesn't have to be snake specific. Mm-hmm. Correct. Okay. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Well, and one thing that you mentioned earlier that I think people uh, often can get confused with is venomous. You meant you said venomous, not poisonous <laughs> snake. Right. So talk about what the difference is there. So <laughs> I like to use it, uh, uh, express it like this. Poisons have to be ingested. You have to eat poisons okay venoms are injected so uh, a wasp will inject a venom a, a snake will inject a venom now not not to say that there's not poisonous snakes uh some of the 
Western species of garter snakes may be poisonous because of what they eat. They eat these highly toxic newts and salamanders, okay. which can build up in their tissues. And if you eat those snakes, you could possibly get poisoned. Okay. And then there's keeled back snakes, which are which we don't have here, are, are poisonous as well. Keeled, K-E-E-L-E-D, keeled. Yeah. Keeled. So how would someone, uh, I never thought about this, but I guess maybe some people eat snakes. Right? Yeah, yeah, they do. Have you, have you eaten it? I have not. Okay. So, <laughs> so it'd be hard to get poisoned. <laughs> Must well, you eat a rattlesnake? If you had a rattlesnake, would it poison you? No. Okay. No, it will not. Because actually, the venom is is uh, enzyme. A digestive enzyme is what venom okay. is. It's for procuring prey items. Uh, venom is not a very effective means of protection. Mm. Uh, uh, the problem with a venom from a snake like that, it, it, uh, uh, if you want to protect you want the individual you bit to survive so they can pass on that information to offspring leave this alone right mm -hmm. if it kills you it does no good <laughs> <laughs> and, and you talked about venom and there are different types of venom can you yes. get into that briefly for us the uh so there's there's different types of venoms and you can find this not only with snakes but with with insects and spiders as well uh, uh so you have near it and, and Trust me, venoms are are a, a conglomerate of different types of enzymes. Is, is what these venoms are, and you can have neurotoxins, which uh, attack the nervous system, uh, histotoxins, which uh, attack tissues, muscles. Uh, you have uh, cytotoxins, which attack and cause leaky cells. Um, uh, uh, Haru. Here we go, hyrulinases, hmm. which will work on uh, uh, like uh, uh, tissues of cartilage and things like that. I mean, it's just a complete mixture. Wow. And temper rattlesnakes actually have some of the most complex venom mixes. They even have some neurotoxic effects in there, um, in their venom making. So it, it doesn't just have one type of Correct. Venom. Correct. Uh, well, the, you have venom, which is made up of many types of enzymes. Okay. So that's why they're pretty hard on you when you get bit. Right. But, but timber rattlesnakes, like I said, they're pretty shy and rare, people rarely get bit by a timber rattlesnake. And even if you do get bit, the likelihood of dying, you're more uh, likely to die from being struck by lightning than from a rattlesnake bite. Well, that, that's good to hear. Yeah. Mm -hmm. it, they're not out to chase you. Uh, no. like, uh, we were talking before the show. I came across one in my yard, and, and it was, you know, it kind of sat there and just kind of watched me, and I went about my business, and, and it was fine being there, and uh, it didn't come after you. There shouldn't be that fear uh, of that happening, right? Correct. That is correct. And this is how I got into temper rattlesnakes, and, and I used to um, have a dirt bike. Okay. And I'd ride motorcycle all over the place, and I happened to come across a, a rattlesnake in the in the road near um, Ledford Mill in, in Tullahoma, Tennessee, you know, closer to Tullahoma than Normandy. And there was a rattlesnake in the road, and I thought, well, I'm going to get this guy to rattle. I, I want to see what this does. Mm -hmm. So I actually got off my bike, went and got a stick, and started poking at the snake, and I couldn't even get the snake to rattle. He just wanted to get off the road and get away. And that made an impression on me and stuck with me the rest of my life. He never even struck at me. And I'm poking him with a stick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Almost prompting him. Yes. Wanting him to. And you talked about earlier, and this, this may help people um, quell the fears of snakes, but you talked about the three different um, escape mechanisms and so mm -hmm. forth, that they, the defense mechanisms. T right. Tell us about that. So uh, if you take a look at a timber rattlesnake, and, and um, I don't know if you can pick that up, and and look at uh, the coloration. So their first line of defense is camouflage. And they're just going to sit still. Mm -hmm. um, if they start feeling threatened, they'll start to rattle. They don't want to give their position away. And once they start rattling, what they want to do is escape. They want to get away. Now, if you happen to be standing in the way of where they want to get, get they're going to come toward you to get under that rock or their safe spot they're not chasing you they know there's a safe spot where they're headed uh, if you just back away leave the snake alone it will not harm you um, I'm, I'm like a 
I've told you guys before, I'm not afraid of snakes out in the woods. It's ticks I have uh, aversion for. And uh, I hate to get too far off, but, but why is that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and then we'll come back. Well, I, I've been hit pretty hard by tick bites. I've right. had uh, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. I've had tularemia. Uh, I've had a, a, a condition called starry. Um, now I have alpha galactose allergy where I cannot eat red meat because being bit by a tick. And I also have a tick bite hypersensitivity as a result of the starry mm. uh, and alpha galactose as well. And that, that, that right there is terrifying to me as a carnivore mm. who loves wild game and, and mm. beef in particular. You cannot eat those things anymore because of that, correct? I cannot. The only mammalian flesh I can eat is human flesh because <laughs> human uh, humans do not have alpha galactose. <laughs> is that a fact? Sugar in their in their meat. Hmm. Well, if you get in a plane crash and uh, <laughs> I don't know if mountains. I could do it anyway. Yeah. <laughs> no. So, but he said that before we we were talking, you know, mm -hmm. early before we started the show, that he is more concerned over tick bites than he is snake bites by far is it that well, is i'm paraphrasing true. but no that's that is absolutely and tell us why we want to hear the story about you getting bit by the snake well we have 10 minutes or so yeah, left yeah. so can you tell us that story about getting bit by the snake and then compare that to the the tick issues all right now the snake bite that it, if you work with rattlesnakes long enough you're going to get bit i've been told that <laughs> um and it was i had been working with rattlesnakes for 29 years before i got bit even came close to getting bit. And I was following textbook procedure. I had the snake in a tube. Yep. And and I had turned the tube. And what I was doing, I was looking for lesions on the snake uh, to, to sample for snake fungal disease. This, is in, this was in the middle of breeding season. And this was a large male timber rattlesnake, about four and a half feet long, full of testosterone. And I had that snake holding the tube, and I took the tail and put it on the tailgate. I, luckily, I was at the uh, uh, ranger's home at uh, Edgar Evans State Park, and he was there with me. Mm. And I turned to look for lesions on the ventral surface of that snake to, to see if I needed to sample. Set the tail on the tailgate, turned the tube, so I'm cranking my clear, hand. Clear tube. Clear plastic okay. tube to yeah. look, and I was getting ready you know, point at something to look at. And I saw, I actually saw the pupil change in the eye of that snake. And he just went ballistic. And, and so I've already compromised how I'm holding the snake. And he started doing a death roll, like a crocodile death roll. Inside spinning, this tube. Inside the tube. And I'm trying to hold. And he actually got it spun to where I'm no longer holding the tube, but just the snake. And then he thrashed. Oh, wow. All at once. I mean, this is just a matter of milliseconds. Twisted and thrashed, and the tube flew off. And I'm holding the snake, and before I could throw and let him go, he come around and nailed me. So where did he hit you? On the arm no, or hand? No, he hit me on the finger. Oh, wow. So you can kind of see that finger is a little baked grab like this and i thought he missed because i felt nothing hmm. i felt absolutely nothing and before i could try and s sling him off he turned his head and then he started just walking those fangs and oh wow and i still didn't feel anything and, and i finally got him flung off and and in the back of the truck there and uh, jake uh, young was the the manager there at uh, Edgar Evans at the time, and I said, I've been tagged. And I looked at my hand, but I didn't see any blood. I didn't feel anything. I didn't see any blood. And I said, let's get this snake secure and get it um, in the bucket. And that's when I saw the blood. But then I felt the tingling in my lip, the neurotoxin kicking mm. in. The neurotoxin, and then it went to my tongue, and I started getting that uh, kind of a coppery, metallic taste, and I've, I've been... I've been nailed. But when I finally got that snake off, there was a rainbow of venom came through the air. Really? That you could see in the air. I mean, he was just pumping it in me. Uh, make a long story short, uh, helicopter ride to uh, Vanderbilt, 14 vials of anti-venine. Um, that was a Sunday afternoon. I was released on Tuesday, 
And then Saturday of that week, I was out tracking snakes. <laughs> it didn't scare you. you. Got right back in. So getting you to the antivenine was the key in yes. saving your so, hand or your life. David, I, I mean, if you could see some of the photos, my arm was turning black, and that's from the breakdown of the of the blood from the um, histotoxins and the venom. Um, but uh, uh, time is tissue. So uh, luckily, uh, uh, the local hospital there in the area, the, the quicker you can get to a hospital and, and get anti-venine, the less damage will be done. And, and really, you can't tell too much. Do you have any residual issues? Oh, yeah. So, you know, I've got, I can't, uh, but it's good enough. Yeah. Can't bend it like you used to. I still have a hand. I still have a finger. Right. <laughs> yeah. I'm still alive. And you were able that, to get back out there and continue your work that you love it. to do. I that's mean, it. And, uh, yeah. And, and to this day, I still worry more about ticks than I do snakes. Yeah. Tell us why that is. Well, the uh, so uh, I've had several different incidences with ticks, and uh, my first one was out at. Uh, uh, working at AEDC back in the early 80s where I got Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And uh, a year or two after that, still working in the same area, I got tularemia. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, working with the rattlesnakes at Center Hill, I got uh, bit by a Lone Star tick. And I can remember it to this day. I was in a power line cut going through and the tick was on the inside of my arm right there. And it started, and Lone Star ticks are notorious. They are aggressive biters. Mm -hmm. And they'll bite till they find a place that they're going to latch on and stay. And I saw it, and then I found it, got it off. But the place where the tick had bit me would not heal. It, And I ended up having to go to a, a, the dermatologist and just get it froze off. Mm. Um, but during that time, I, I got this, uh, it's called Starry. It's a, a southern tick uh, rash from the Lone Star tick. Didn't tie anything else into that, Starry. Mm. Got the rash. Um, finally, all that cleared up. But what followed was the alpha galactose allergy to where I can't eat red meat. Some scary stuff there, but... Uh, I love that it didn't hinder your passion for your work and that you continued and, and kept working. Uh, uh, some of the, I guess some of the things you have to face when went out in that line of work, but I, you still share your passion, continue teaching, continue studying. Um, but I'm, I'm glad you're here. <laughs> no doubt. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> so you're retired now as a professor, but still doing research. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, not as not as much into it as I was. I'm long in the tooth now and climbing those mountains uh, it's, <laughs> it's not fun anymore. I mean, you get out and do it when you want to and, and enjoy it. And, and I don't mind doing surgeries and planting transmitters and things like that so yeah. I can still do that. Awesome. awesome. Well I appreciate the info today and, and sharing your passion and, and uh, maybe it encourage some folks to get out there and <laughs> pursue this, this line of work and uh, explore Cumberland University. So, Matt, I appreciate you lying. Oh, stuff. man. Yeah, I feel like he could go on and on and on. And I'd love to hear him do that. He knows a lot about uh, fire ants, too. So yeah. maybe we'll get you back on sometime. You can talk about okay. fire ants and insects, if you would. Yep. yep. Well, it, well, you know, that goes ties it in because the snakes keep the mice under control. Where this alpha gal's coming from are mice and deer with the ticks. So rodent populations, more people are going to come up with this alpha gal allergy. Wow. That's a circle of life right there. And the crows as a nest predator of wild turkey yeah. eggs. Yes, they are. I've, I've preached against coons, foxes, and skunks and raccoons, but he added crows to the list. <laughs> well, uh, sounds like there's a lot more that we could do in the future, so uh, keep coming back. Keep listening. Keep watching. This is Tennessee Wildcast, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in. Stay connected with TWRA by visiting our website at tnwildlife.org. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Hey, it's all about Tennessee wildlife. It's what we do. Tennessee Wildcast will be on the air again next week. We'll see you then.